Jesus' name, amen and amen. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. So this morning is the 15th Sunday after the, sea, or after the day of Pentecost in this season of ordinary time. So we are starting this morning a new sermon series. This is the first week in this series. And we have titled it, Encountering Jesus in Mark, Lessons in Discipleship. So in this series, we'll exp- we will explore what it means to follow Jesus with a transformed heart. Embracing his teachings on faith, humility, and sacrifice. Each week we will be challenged to deepen our discipleship and live out the values of the kingdom of God in our everyday lives. So I'm very excited for what God is going to do in my life through this series. And I'm excited that you guys are going to come along as well. So it's going to run for the next 12 weeks, taking us all the way to Christ the King Sunday, which will be the last Sunday in the church calendar year. The following week we'll begin a new calendar year, church calendar year, with the season of Advent. So for the next 12 weeks we're going to be digging deeply into discipleship in the Gospel of Mark. So this morning's text brings us to the seventh chapter in the book of Mark. So if you'd like to follow along in a Bible this morning, now would be a great time to flip over to Mark chapter 7. And we're going to be looking specifically at verses 1 through 23. So many years ago now, I was a freshman in high school, and I was invited to prom by a girl who was a senior. Yeah. Now, I know what you're thinking. Derek must have been way cooler back then than he is now. But I promise by the end of this story, I will debunk that myth. I was definitely feeling cool in the moment when I was only one of a handful of underclassmen who got invited to prom that year. I was feeling cool, that is, until I had to decide and figure out what to wear. So I was kind of a a pair of jeans or cargo shorts kind of guy, wore a t-shirt most days. I didn't dress up. And if I I was trying to look good, it would be like jeans, a clean t-shirt, and I would like maybe throw some water on my hair and, and comb it maybe even. But most days, I didn't even comb my hair. So when I picked up my impossibly ill-fitting tuxedo for prom that year, put it on and looked in the mirror, as much as I hoped this would be the case, I looked nothing like James Bond, believe it or not. I looked like a goofy kid in an ill-fitting tuxedo. I just wanted to look as cool as I felt in those moments. For some reason, I thought that maybe a tuxedo would make me look as cool as I felt. However, when I looked in the mirror, all I saw was an awkward 15-year-old with a bad haircut. I still saw insecure me. For whatever reason, I was fixated on my hair. And as if that was the thing that would have turned me into James Mott, not the extra 30 pounds of muscle and uh, a stylist and all those things. So I looked in the mirror and and I was trying to figure out how I was going to fix my hair for prom. So I combed it, I spiked it, I used every product in the medicine cabinet, and no matter what I did, I still continued to look like a goofy kid with a bad haircut. So the smart play would have been to not draw attention to myself, to sort of fly under the radar, being this was my first prom, and just enjoy it. But I was still fixated on my hair for whatever reason. That's when I remembered somebody had given me years prior to this, this ridiculous hat. It was sort of a hard felt hat with a round top and a shallow bill. Uh, it's known as a bowler hat or a, um, a derby sometimes. All I knew, though, was that it covered up my hair and it looked somewhat formal. So I was convinced that I had to wear this hat. And against the advice of everybody who saw me in the hat, I did wear it. There are pictures to prove it. I thought about digging one up and having it show up on the screen behind me during this time, but if you want to see it, it's going to cost you. You have to buy me a coffee or a beer and I'll I'll show you this photo. But I spent so much time worrying about my outside appearance that I'm pretty sure I forgot to have fun. 
Other than what I wore, I don't really remember anything about that prom night. And I was so concerned about my appearance that I totally missed the point of prom. Have you ever found yourself in a similar situation? Where on the outside, perhaps you look great, but the inside, you have a different story going on? Where you feel the pressure to present a certain image, even if it doesn't reflect your true state of being? Well, join the club. (laughs) We live in a society where we often feel immense pressure to conform to certain ideals or images. We judge people based on external factors like appearance and success and social status and even religious practices. In a world where social media is the norm, the the standard of sort of carefully curated personality is impossible to live up to. Now, I feel like I rag on social media a lot, and I promise I'm not against it. I have it myself. But I think it's worth pointing out, though, that that there are ways that it shapes us. For the purposes of our sermon this morning, it has the potential to cause a disconnect between how we present ourselves to the outside world and how we truly are on the inside. Now, this isn't the exclusive realm of social media. This has always been a temptation. But we live in a world where it's possible to show people the the sort of inner workings of our lives, though through a carefully curated lens showing only the beautiful parts. Participating in in this, or even just viewing it, can lead us to feeling this sort of disconnect from what we show the outside world and what we actually experience on the inside. This sort of disconnect between the external and the internal can be particularly painful in the area of faith. Again, this is not a, a new problem as we'll see in our text today, but I know of my own experience growing up in the faith that it was filled with people who were one way throughout the week and a completely different way on Sunday. Who knows what was happening all week long, but every single Sunday, people were cleaned up, dressed up, and were ready to put a smile on their faces and pretend like everything was okay. Are there times where you felt this temptation to focus on the external? I would just encourage you this morning to to think about these moments, these moments where we prioritized appearances over genuine faith, or performed religious duties out of obligation rather than heartfelt devotion. I think if we're honest, none of us are immune from this temptation. How often do we find ourselves doing the right or the right things for the wrong reasons? Are there times when our faith feels more like a checklist than a deep, transformative relationship with the God of the universe? Once again, the temptation is not new, right? And goes to the very heart of being human and living in a broken world. And Jesus confronts this temptation in our passage today. So let's turn once again to Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 23, and look at... This passage where Jesus challenges us to look beyond the surface level and to address the true condition of our hearts. Let's read together, picking up in verse 1. It says, Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Now, it's incredibly tempting to read this passage with sort of 21st century eyes. We know about germs and bacteria, and we are confident that washing our hands is a good thing, right? Objectively good. To not wash hands before eating a meal is kind of gross. And therefore, we tend to side with the Pharisees on some level, right? Thinking that it's 
icky to not wash your hands before you eat. The Pharisees didn't possess some sort of untimely knowledge or understanding of matters of germs and bacteria, though. They were first century people and had no awareness that these things even existed. What they had, though, was an immense amount of knowledge of the Hebrew Bible, which we call our Old Testament. The Pharisees had gone through it and picked out 613 direct commands from God to people. But not only had they found those 613 direct commands, but they had come up with thousands of other sort of related commands in terms of how to live this out in the context of of normal life. These were found in in the sort of oral law or a supplemental law. They were later codified in texts like the Mishnah and the Talmud. They offer details on daily life, like how to observe the Sabbath, about dietary laws and purity laws. But not only did they have these thousands of commands that they were following, but they also created these sort of fences around the law to safeguard against even coming close to accidentally breaking one of the laws. For example, avoiding breaking the Sabbath, right? They added specific prohibitions on what constituted work, and these still exist. The rules concerning hand-washing were not among the 613 direct commands from God. A few passages in the Old Testament refer to hand-washing, but all of them are given in the context of worship and are given to priests specifically. And none have anything to do with sort of normal folks washing before a meal. But the problem then is not with washing specifically. There's no problem necessarily with washing your hands before a meal. There's not a command against it either. But in the fact that they had put hand washing on the same level as the direct commands from God. And they used that as a sort of measuring stick to figure out one's religious standing in the community. So with this understanding, they are obviously indignant that Jesus, a teacher within the religious life of of the community, was, was allowing his disciples to break one of the rules. Their understanding was that this ritual was a marker of one standing with God. So to avoid the ritual meant to be out of step with God personally. Here's this religious teacher who in many ways is saying things that are are similar to the things that the Pharisees were saying, but who is not teaching his disciples to follow the traditions of the elders. He needed to be brought into line. Jesus jumps straight to the heart of the matter, though. He responds saying, well, did Isaiah not prophecy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles his father and mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. And he called the people to him and and again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But things that come out of a person are what defile him. So Jesus uses this idea of Corban to point out the inconsistencies in their teaching. Now, Corbin was just a vow that was made by a person to devote a portion of their net worth to God, which was then sort of protected from all other obligations. There were apparently some people who were using this in a sort of manipulative fashion, so they didn't like their parents, so they would set aside this portion of of their worth in order to shelter it from the obligation to take care of their parents when they were old, thereby violating the fifth commandment, right? To honor their father and their mother. Sort of classic hypocrisy and what Isaiah had prophesied against, yet completely acceptable to the leaders within the Jewish religion at this point. They were sort of diligent in their outward observance, but their hearts were not aligned with God. Their worship was hollow because it was focused on human traditions, 
rather than a genuine love for God. See, God made flesh with standing in front of them, and they were concerned about hand washing. Jesus takes it a step further, though, right? And he really turns things upside down when he teaches the crowd that, in fact, there is nothing outside a person that is going, that, that by going in can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile them. They were concerned about the unclean world accidentally getting in via their unwashed hands. But Jesus informs them that uncleanness comes from within. See, this squares beautifully with what we know of the human condition. Right? The consequence of sin is death. The unclean things don't convey uncleanness to us, but they draw out to the surface the uncleanness that dwells within This is why Jesus, when he came into contact with people who were ceremonially or ritually unclean, did not contract their uncleanness. There was no death in him. But rather, when he touched them, his cleanness was drawn out and into them. They became clean. His wholeness, rather, was drawn into them. And they were made well. The disciples still didn't get it, right? This is their their sort of place in Mark is to not understand what's going on. So they ask Jesus for clarification, and Jesus says, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean, the parenthetical says. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. See, the Pharisees were concerned with ritual purity, and God was concerned with true purity of the heart. Ritual purity is only helpful in that it allows and that one allows it to transform the heart, not substitute for it. Jesus, in this statement, redefines purity as an issue of the heart, not of external observance. He emphasizes that true defilement comes from within, from the sinful desires and thoughts that reside in the human heart. At this point, it would be super easy to sort of stand in a place of judgment over the the stupid disciples and the stupid Pharisees. They just don't get it. And to think, look at those fools, right? They thought that washing your hands would make them right with God. How silly is that? But rather than judgment, I'd like for us to take this as an opportunity to consider the ways that we might have the same patterns of thought. If I do this, then God will do that. God is not a magic genie in a bottle that if, that's there to be found and, and grant three wishes to anyone who finds it. No amount of religious observance can make us right with God. Faith and trust in Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross is the only thing that can make us right with God. Jesus, who took the sins of the world on himself, and died once for all for those sins is the only thing that can make us right with God. The question of observance of the commands of God comes only secondary to being made right with God. You cannot earn God's love, yet it has been freely given to be received by faith. That being said, observing God's commands is evidence of a transformed heart. True purity can only come through a transformed heart. And that transformed heart can only come through a relationship with God. Rituals are and always have been an aspect of this relationship. There are things that we've been commanded to do, simply. But rather than make us right with God, they order our lives in such a way that our hearts are aimed at God. They have no power in and of themselves to do anything. 
empowered by the Spirit, in the life who, of one who has had their hearts transformed in the context of faith, they have the power to draw us closer in that relationship with God. Again, out of context, they're nothing. Mere observance has never and will never make us anything other than a hypocrite. Now, this is not a systematic critique of all ritual, obviously. We love our ceremonies here. But it is a moment for honest reflection on our own lives. Are there areas of your life where you prioritize outward conformity over inward change? Do you find yourself going through the motions of spiritual practice without engaging your heart? Are there hidden sins or struggles that you've been ignoring, focusing instead on maintaining the image of righteousness? Do you slap on a happy face every time you walk in the church, whether you feel like it or not, pretending that everything's okay? Maybe one of those questions stuck out to you this morning. You know you're in a place where you've focused on appearance of righteousness rather than true righteousness. What do you do? Maybe you've been dealing with a particular issue for so long that you feel like you have no idea how to move forward. Maybe you're doing all the right things already, but your problem never goes away. Well, here are a few tips. And this is not rocket science. It may well be all the things you're already doing, but I hope to provide a little bit of a different spin or a little different context to them that you might engage them more fully and live a transformed life that is fully integrated and lacks the plague of hypocrisy. So the first step is always repentance. The first step is always repentance. You must confess and with an earnest heart intend to turn from your wickedness and live, as our baptismal confession says. Pray that God would cleanse your heart and that he would act like a skillful gardener to prune away unhealth or death so that, you might, so that new growth and health might occur. Next, pray. Pray. Pray that God will reveal and heal areas of your heart in need of transformation. Focus on gratitude for the things revealed and ask God to assist you in the process of transformation. Pray scriptures like uh, Psalm 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Next, following on that point, engage with Scripture. Regularly read God's Word. Reflectively read with the aim of letting God's Word penetrate deeply into your heart. Perhaps consider journaling some of your thoughts as you read in order to engage more fully with Scripture and to sort of track how God is working in your heart over time. Pray before you read that the Holy Spirit would reveal things in God's word to you, that he would make things stand out in a different way. And he will do it, I promise. Receive them as a gift and align yourself with his word. Now, if you need guidance in how to do these things, the beauty of our tradition is that the first three steps are contained in our daily office. All you have to do is pull out a book of common prayer, turn to page 11 in the morning, and Start with repentance, pray, and read God's word. Now, this is not the be-all, end-all of, of confession and prayer and reading scripture, but it's a helpful place to start. Open your heart to the transforming love of, love of God and receive it as you play, pray the daily office. And the last thing that I would suggest is simply to engage in the community of the faithful. There are amazing people here who are here to encourage you and to hear your struggles. Find someone to share your struggles with. Ask for accountability, not with the intention that they would have some sort of ability in your life to enforce the rules, but because we all have blind spots and we need others to help us see them. In this context of mutual support and accountability, we can find support for genuine spiritual growth. Now, we all know we're messed up. We all know that we are, are deeply broken. And we're all inclined to think that the person down the pew from us has it all figured out. We don't. 
What we can be, though, is a community that prioritizes transformation over external appearances, where we can come together and be truly who we are because we know that there is an infinite God of grace who has offered that grace to us. And that in that grace, we can work toward true transformation. Can we sort of make a collective commitment to this end this morning? Can we commit for the remainder of this sermon series, at least for 12 weeks, to seek God's transformation in our hearts? I believe that as we do this, that God will be faithful to do the work. And we will experience growth and health like we've never seen before. Will you join me in this this morning? So before we close our sermon time, I want to encourage you to take a few moments. Take a few moments of quiet and pray that God would reveal areas of your heart where you're not fully engaged. We aren't done worshiping God yet this morning, so God's not done with us. Even this morning, he's not done. Pray that he will give you eyes to see how he is transforming you right now. Even as we continue worshiping together. And pray that he might give you freedom to live an authentically transformed life. All for his glory. So I offer you this to you this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray.